Hello, I'm the Dungeon Doctor. If you're new here, welcome to my channel. In this video, I'm going to continue on my quest to optimize every single monk subclass. This week, I'm looking at how we can make an optimized build for the Way of the Ascendant Dragon for a typical level 1 to 12 campaign. If you want to hear my thoughts on the subclass, check out my previous video here where I share my thoughts on it. In that video, I found the Way of the Ascendant Dragon provides a versatile blaster capable of creating low power blast effects with a range of shapes and damage types. Because these blasts come from us in a cone or line, we're better off using hit and run tactics, as this ensures we're always free to position our blasts where we need them. Something I don't think that gets talked about enough though is that hit and run playstyles aren't necessarily party friendly. Sure, we might be able to deal damage, but these tactics don't do that much to help fellow players who are in the front lines of combat taking those hits for us. So in addition to hit and run tactics, I'll be showing how we can blend control or support effects into our tactics so our frontliners can continue to do their good work. For the inspiration behind this build, I went through a lot of options. As you may have seen from my teaser last week, we'll be delivering on a lot of epic damage. Because of this, I considered characters such as Thor or a Sith Lord from Star Wars like the Emperor. But as you can probably see from the thumbnail, I eventually settled on the fan favourite villain from Avatar The Last Airbender, Azula, Princess of the Fire Nation. One part of the Avatar fantasy that was missing from the Four Elements monk was the ability to do other popular forms of element bending, such as lightning bending. And the way of the Ascendant Dragon actually gives us a way we can harness both fire and lightning, letting us deliver on the fantasy of a prodigy firebender. So, Let's see how we can build this terrifying queen in D&D 5e. Before we carry on with the video though, please do take the time to maybe like, subscribe to the channel, and put in your thoughts on the video in the comments below. All of this really helps this really small and growing channel, and trust me, every comment that you leave is very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Races and ability scores. Before we choose our race, we should keep in mind that this build will benefit from two feats. The feats I have in mind are Fey Touched and Telekinetic. Both of these can give us a plus one to our Wisdom score, which we'll be focusing on increasing as quickly as possible on this build. So if we go with Variant Human, we'll be able to pick up one of these feats at level one and another one when we reach level four in a class. If we go for a different race, then we can only really afford to pick up one of these feats on this build. Of the two options, I think Fey Touched will be more important for us, so if we choose a different race, then I would pick that up at the first opportunity. For other race options, we should keep in mind this is going to be a hit and run striker, so races capable of flying would be really good. I also think Bugbear is a really powerful option, as their extra reach will let them move in and out of melee better. Also, we can get a lot out of the extra damage they apply with their surprise attack feature, so actually this race could be stronger than Variant Human on this build. For other races, we might consider Goblin and Harangon, as both of these have ways to disengage from creatures as a bonus action, and if only for flavour, I really like the idea of a way of the Ascendant Dragon Kobold. It's just something really wholesome about a little dragon mimicking a big dragon. And finally, we have to talk about the Dragonborn options from Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. I wouldn't usually talk about them as options, but because we're using a subclass from that book, I think it's guaranteed we'd be allowed to use one of these races if we were permitted to use this subclass. Because these races use the same mechanic as our Draconic Breath feature, when we gain the extra attack feature, we would be able to make two breath weapon attacks on our turn. Colby at D4 Deep Dive actually did the same trick with his own build on the Ascendant Dragon when the race came out. So check that out if you want to see how to get a lot out of that combo. If we were to use one of these Dragonborn races, we would need to pick either the Blue, Sapphire or Bronze Dragonborn. Each of these options uses either Lightning or Thunder damage for their Breath Weapon attack, and that's going to come in useful later in this build. All in all, there's actually a lot of different races we could use for this build, so that's great. I, I actually really like it when a build allows you to make use of pretty much any race. That way we're not really sacrificing roleplay for the sake of mechanics. For our ability scores, we're going to be focusing hard on Wisdom and Dexterity. So, assuming we're going with the point by method, we'll go with an 8 in Strength, a 15 in Dexterity, which we'll add a plus 1 to from our race. We're going to put a 14 into Constitution, an 8 into Intelligence, 
a 15 into Wisdom. If we've gone with the Variant Human option, we'll add a plus one to our Wisdom from our race, an additional plus one to it from our feet Fey touched. Or if we've gone with another race, then we could put in our remaining plus two from our race into Wisdom. The idea is that we'll have a total of 17 in our Wisdom, so that then when we get our first ability score increase in a class, we'll be able to round it off to 18 using another half feet. And for our charisma, we've got two points left from our point by method, so let's put the remaining two into that, so we have a charisma of 10. If we went with Fairy and Human, then we currently have the Fey Touched feat. That will give us access to the Misty Step spell, and a first level spell from the Divination or Enchantment schools of magic. Also, we can cast each of these spells once per long rest for free. The first level spell we're going to pick up on this build is Hunter's Mark. We'll talk more about how we'll use this as we level up, but it's going to give us a useful damage boost on this build. And for the skills from our background or race, what we'd really like is proficiency in both Intimidation and Persuasion, so we'll be able to make the most of our Draconic Presence feature later. We'll actually be able to pick up Persuasion from our class though, so at this point we only really need to focus on getting Intimidation. Otherwise, skills that work really well on a monk are Stealth and Perception, as we'll have a good Dexterity and a good Wisdom score. So, with our races and ability scores out of the way, let's start with our classes. Beginning with... Level 1. Cleric 1. For our starting class, we're actually going to go with Cleric, starting with the Tempest Cleric subclass. This is going to give us proficiency in Wisdom and Charisma saving throws, martial weapons, proficiency in all armor and shields, and of course, spellcasting. As in previous builds, martial weapon proficiencies are welcome on a monk. We can pick up a longbow for fighting creatures at range using our Great Dexterity. I also really like the whip on this build. It's a finesse weapon, so we can use it with our dexterity, and because it has reach, it'll be useful for when we want to hit and run against creatures. Also, if we pick up the dedicated weapon feature from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything later, then we can make a martial weapon a monk weapon, so that we deal slightly better damage. So actually, at some point, we could potentially use a Warhammer as a monk weapon, which is really great if we want to lean more into a Thor-inspired build. For our armor, we haven't got great strength, so unless we're lucky enough to pick up Mithril, That was weird. Unless we're lucky enough to pick up Mithril Full Plate, we won't be able to use heavy armor. Instead, we would initially use medium armor as shield, which from our starting equipment would give us a starting armor class of 18. From the Tempest domain, we gain a subclass feature and domain spells added to our spell list. With the subclass feature Wrath of the Storm, we can, as a reaction, cause a creature within 5 feet of us, which has just hit us with an attack, to take 2d8 lightning damage, or thunder damage, our choice, or half as much if they succeed on a dexterity saving throw. With our current wisdom modifier, we can use this up to three times a day. So while we're trying to be a hit and run striker, the creatures which do pursue us are going to get hurt if they do try and engage us in melee. And because we'll initially be focusing on increasing our wisdom modifier, we'll have a decent number of usages of this ability each long rest. As a cleric, we also gain spell casting. Before we talk about the cleric spell list though, we should check out what the domain gets us. Initially, we get the spells Fog Cloud and Thunder Wave added to our spell list. I can't tell you the number of times I've played a spellcaster and wished I had access to the Fog Cloud spell. If your party is surrounded and you need a way to get everyone to a safer position, then this is so useful. As for a creature to make an opportunity attack against you, it must be able to see your character. And on a hit and run character, Fog Cloud can be a good option to let us get that free disengage action round after round. Or if you need to do something sneaky in an area with no cover, this is a fantastic spell to make that possible. Meanwhile, Thunder Wave gives us a nice blast spell with some forced movement. We're going to get a lot of blasting options on this build with lots of different sizes and shapes to choose from. Thunder Wave is going to be just the first of many options available to us. As for the rest of the cleric spell list, there are too many great spells at level 1 to choose from to go into much detail, so here's a quick list of the ones I think we should consider. For now though, I recommend we pick up Healing Word, Shield of Faith, Bless, and Bane. Let's talk a bit more about Bane. When we cast it, 
three creatures of our choice within 30 feet need to make a charisma saving throw. If they fail, then they have to subtract a d4 die from all of their attack rolls and saving throws while we maintain concentration. This spell complements the monk's stunning strike really well. Stunning strike targets a creature's constitution saving throw, which is usually pretty good. Meanwhile, Bane targets charisma, and very few creatures boast both a great charisma saving throw and a great constitution saving throw. So, if we cast Bane on round one on a group of enemies, we can pretty reliably add a debuff to their saving throws against Stunning Strike. So then on our next turn, we can more reliably use Stunning Strike on any creatures who we know are under the effects of the Bane spell. Finally, for cantrips, we can pick three at this stage. Because we're going to be picking up monk levels, we don't really need damaging cantrips, so we can focus on utility instead. I personally like Guidance, Light, and Thaumaturgy, as they're all useful and very thematic cantrips on this build. Or, if you find Guidance can be a bit problematic as a spell, I would consider picking up Spare the Dying, which is just a useful cantrip to have. I like the idea that with both Healing Word and Spare the Dying, we can flavour it as we're defibrillating downed creatures with Lightning. At this level, we can either focus on supporting allies with our spells, or we can use our Hunter's Mark spell to focus on damaging a single creature. Currently, we only get one attack each turn, but that's going to change as we get to level 2, Cleric 1, Monk 1. With Monk 1, we gain Unarmored Defense and Martial Arts. To make the most of Martial Arts, we need to take off the Armor and Shield, reducing our Armor class from 18 to 16. This is a big blow, but I think on this build, it's not a big loss. We'll be focused on hit and run tactics and supporting allies from the back line. But if we ever do pick up that Mithril full plate, Mithril. Stop it. Then having an 18 armor class or 20 with a shield will be hard to pass up. If we're dealing with one or two tough enemies, then I think we should start with Hunter's Mark and a ranged attack on turn one, and then follow this up with a quarterstaff and unarmed strike on the next turn to deal lots of damage. It's roughly equivalent to hitting twice with a greatsword, so not a bad start. Because we have one free casting of Hunter's Mark and two spell slots from Cleric, we can use this tactic reasonably often at this level. But if we're dealing with multiple enemies, then we may want to use spells like Thunderwave or Bane instead. This build is going to consistently have options for both single targets and multiple targets. Level 3. Cleric 1, Monk 2. A Monk 2 we gain key, which we can spend to use either Flurry of Blows, Patient Defense, or Step of the Wind as a bonus action. We can also now use the dedicated weapon feature if it's available to us, so go ahead and use either a whip or warhammer as your monk weapon. At this level, Flourish Blows in combination with Hunter's Mark can let us do a decent bit of burst damage on a single creature, as we'll get an extra d6 of damage for each hit we make on them. With 3 attacks per turn, this is going to give us a lot of damage for this level, but keep in mind that it takes a round setup, so it's only really great if we're facing one or two tough creatures. Meanwhile, Step of the Wind and Patient Defense are good options for keeping us out of combat or safe from attacks. If we do feel like tanking, we may want to consider casting Sanctuary on ourselves when we're in a good position on the battlefield. On following turns, we could then use our action to help creatures, either doing some healing or using the help action to give characters advantage. Meanwhile, we then use a bonus action for Patient Defense to make us even harder to hit. Level 4. Cleric 1, Monk 3. When we reach Monk 3, we gain our Monk subclass, the Way of the Ascendant Dragon. Firstly, we get Draconic Presence, so we can intimidate and persuade people much more reliably. Getting a free reroll and having proficiency in these two skills means that even with a low charisma, we can still contribute in social situations. It makes me think of the way Azula clearly hates people, but occasionally she can wield her princess privilege or power to get her own way. With Tongue of the Dragon, we can speak Draconic, which is always welcome, but I think picking up Primordial to speak with the spirits of lightning and fire might be appropriate too. Next, let's discuss Draconic Strikes. This allows us to transform the damage of our unarmed strikes into acid, fire, lightning, cold, or poison damage. This is pretty nice as it allows us to take advantage of damage vulnerabilities, even if they don't come up too often. The most common vulnerability we'll come across is to fire, so we can activate our fire damage whenever we see something flammable, like a plant, something made out of wood, or something that regenerates. The other damage types aren't as common as vulnerabilities, but they can be useful options for avoiding damage resistance. I think acid in particular is very rarely resisted, but this is the way of lightning, so how are we making the most of that? 
Well, for that, we'll need some patience, but eventually it's going to be our strongest element. When we do find a damage vulnerability to something like fire damage, we're going to be able to exploit it to its fullest. The spell Hunter's Mark has a very useful property that makes it a bit better than Hex for us, in that rather than adding just additional damage of a particular type, it specifically increases our weapon's damage. When we use Draconic Strikes, this means the Hunter's Mark damage will match that of our unarmed strikes. So if we're fighting a creature that is vulnerable to fire damage, they'll be vulnerable both to our unarmed strike damage and our Hunter's Mark damage. Another trick we can pull off with Draconic Strikes at this level involves a very cheap piece of equipment, a flask of oil. Each flask only costs a silver piece, so we could easily carry I don't know, maybe as many as 10 of these around with us and spend very little doing so. And this is how we use them. With our attack action, we can throw a flask as an improvised weapon. This will deal 1d4 plus our dexterity modifier in bludgeoning damage to a creature. Also, a d6 of damage from a hunter's mark if that's active. I don't know why, but the idea of activating hunter's mark with effectively a clay pot is pretty hilarious to me. Then with our bonus action, we can either use Martial Arts or Flurry of Blows to deal fire damage on a creature we hit with the flask. When the creature takes that fire damage, the oil is burnt up and they take an additional 5 fire damage. So that clay pot actually dealt on average 7.5 damage, which is about as good as a greatsword, provided that we can land that fire damage which eventually I'm sure we could. Depending on the table, we may not be able to use martial arts in combination with throwing an improvised weapon, but honestly, a clay pot is such a simple weapon, I think it's reasonable to say that it should be allowed. If it's not though, we can still use Flurry of Blows, as that simply needs us to use an attack action. If for whatever reason we're having difficulty landing that fire damage, we may want to use something more reliable on the following turn, something like a Draconic Breath. With Draconic Breath, we can breathe either a 30-foot line or 20-foot cone of Draconic Breath. Currently, this will deal 2d4 of either acid, code, fire, lightning, or poison damage, or half if a creature succeeds on a dexterity saving throw. If we have previously oiled a creature, it doesn't matter whether they make that saving throw, they're going to take the additional 5 fire damage from the oil. Draconic Breath, in addition to Thunder Wave, means we have two blast effects at this level and between them, we've already got a lot of versatile options. With Thunder Wave, we can position a 15-foot cube anywhere so long as we're in contact with it somewhere. Note, this should include actually just on the corner of the cube as well, as the rules say we only need to be in contact with a side. If we say we're in contact with the very edge of a cube, we're still in touch with its side. And because spells affecting half of a 5-foot square's area cause an effect, we can approximate the overall effect to us just being in touch with a corner. So this gives us lots of options where we can set this blast effect. But with Draconic Breath, we have even more options. With a 5 foot line, we can actually affect two adjacent squares by covering half of each of them, which means that we can affect a 10 foot wide by 30 foot long area. And the cone effect covers a massive area, which we can often tilt in such a way that it misses adjacent allies but hits groups of enemies beyond them. And on top of this, we can vary the damage type of the breath weapon to do something reliable or maybe even exploit a vulnerability. A lot of blaster casters have a handful of great spells, things like shatter or fireball that they can cast. But what they often don't have is the versatility to make these spells avoid allies and potentially maximize the number of enemies that they hit. The one exception to this rule I could name is maybe the Evocation Wizard, but even then, their versatility comes at the expense of their spells known. In addition to our subclass feature, we gain Deflect Missiles. It's a useful feature on this build, as creatures may be more likely to target us with ranged attacks as we're trying to stay out of the front lines. Level 5. Cleric 1, Monk 4. Reaching level 5, our proficiency bonus increases to 3, giving us an additional free use of Draconic Breath each day. We also gain our first ability score increase, which for other race options will be when we finally pick up the Fey Touched feat. For Variant Human, however, this is where we'll grab the Telekinetic feat. Telekinetic is very good on this build. Firstly, it gives us a plus one to either Wisdom, Intelligence, or Charisma. For us, we'll be using this to round up our Wisdom score to an 18. Next, it gives us the Mage Hand Cantrip, which we can cast without verbal or somatic components, and we can make it invisible. Awesome utility and really fun flavour if we were going for that Sith-inspired character. 
But the most important feature it gives us is a telekinetic shove. As a bonus action, we can attempt to move either our monster or ally five foot towards us or away from us. If the creature is unwilling, it will need to make a strength saving throw against our spell save DC, determined by the ability score the feat increased. For us, this is wisdom, so it's the same as our key save DC. Meanwhile, an ally can choose to just let the effect happen. The range of our telekinetic shove is 30 feet, which, while short, is actually about the same length as our blast effects. On this character, the telekinetic shove is going to give us a lot of options for moving creatures to better positions to make the most of our blasts. If we want to blast an area but an ally is there, telekinetic shove can likely allow us to move them out of the range of effect. Or if there's a monster just out of reach of our blast, we could use this to attempt to pull them into the area of the effect. I should point out that telekinetic shove doesn't actually care what size a creature is, so that gives it a bit more versatility. Meanwhile, if a monster has engaged us and we want to disengage from them without spending key, we can attempt to push them away with this ability. Similarly, if our frontliners are in trouble or just want to get into a better position, we can use the shove to move them into a better position. Telekinetic shove is a play-defining feature on this build. It gives us options to amplify our blasting, let us lean into hit-and-run playstyle, and support our allies. With our wisdom now at 18, we'll have a key save DC of 15, our unarmored defense is 17, and also we'll have up to four uses of Wrath of the Storm. So even though level five is where a lot of characters would gain the extra attack feature, I think this level is still gonna feel suitably impactful for us. Level six, Cleric one, Monk five. A Monk five, we're going to gain Stunning Strike and extra attack. Now that we have Stunning Strike, we can use it in combination with the Bane spell to potentially lock down creatures. On turn one, we would cast Bane, and then on the following turn, we would perhaps use our Whip to attack a creature under its effect from 10 foot away. I like to imagine it's almost like a taser attack, as we send an electric current through the Whip, which, by the way, is now dealing a d6 of damage if it's our dedicated monk weapon. Between our key save DC of 15 and the d4 a creature subtracts from their saving throw because of Bane, our stunning strikes are going to be pretty reliable, even if the creature has a decent constitution modifier. And because Bane affects up to three creatures, we could potentially live up to that monk fantasy of stunning multiple creatures in a single round of combat. With extra attack, we can also use the oil flask trick a little more reliably. With our first attack, we can throw the flask at a creature to deliver a small bit of damage. Again, a lenient DM might rule the flask can be called a simple weapon, so if that's the case, we now get to roll a d6 damage for it instead of a d4. And then with the remaining attack from our extra attack feature, we can use our fire breath to guarantee that we ignite that oil. Or if we have thought ahead and are currently holding two flasks of oil in our hands on our turn, we could attempt to oil two creatures with our attack action and then hit them both with our fiery flurry of blows. All of this we can combine with Hunter's Mark, which can add a d6 to our attacks, again allowing us to stack additional damage against a single creature. Lots of really fun damaging abilities. Now, having gained level 5 in Monk, it may be tempting to take that additional level to get level 6, which would allow us to pick up our 6th level feature, Wings Unfilled. It's not a bad idea, and if we're in a campaign where we think the occasional temporary flight could be useful, it may be a good call. However, we're going to get a lot more out of pursuing our Cleric levels sooner. Also, the other Monk feature we could gain, Key Empowered Strike, doesn't actually benefit the Way of Ascendant Dragon Monk that much. Because we can choose what damage type we deal with our unarmed strikes, we should be able to reliably choose a damage type that a creature doesn't resist. That means that doing magical bludgeoning damage with our unarmed strikes doesn't really benefit us. So with all that in mind, let's see why picking up more Cleric levels works so well for this build. Level 7. Cleric 2, Monk 5. At Cleric 2, we gain an additional spell slot and our channel divinity option, Destructive Wrath. Now things are going to get very interesting from a damage perspective. When we deal lightning or thunder damage to a creature, we can use our channel divinity to treat any damage dice that we've rolled as having rolled their maximum value. For Tempest Clerics, this would mean when they cast a leveled spell like Thunder Wave or Shatter, they can deal extra damage. This is a nice feature, but on that subclass it has a flaw. They either have to use a leveled spell to activate the ability, or they have to wait for a creature to hit them first so they can activate it with their Wrath of the Storm feature. And the thing is, the extra damage on a spell is welcome, but spell slots are a very precious and versatile resource. That spell slot could be the healing word that gets an ally up from zero hit points. It could be the Shield of Faith that we're assisting a frontline tank with. 
Or it could be the Bane spell that is impacting creatures, attack rolls and saving throws. Additionally, when we cast a leveled spell on our turn, we're much more limited with what we can do with our bonus action. Suddenly we can't cast spells like Shield of Faith, Hunter's Mark or Healing Word because we can only cast one leveled spell on our turn at a time. The other option Tempest Clerics can use, Wrath of the Storm, requires that a creature hit us first and we don't actually get to choose when that happens. Meanwhile, on a build that uses the Way of the Ascendant Dragon, we have many more options for how we can use the Destructive Wrath feature. Firstly, we could use it with our Draconic Breath with the Lightning option. Now, this won't be as powerful as if we were using it with the Thunder Wave or later the Shatter spell, as we're only maximizing 2d6 damage. But we have to remember Draconic Breath is much more versatile, as we can choose to use it in a 30-foot line or 20-foot cone, so we can probably hit more creatures with it and do a better job avoiding our allies. Also, we can use it as part of an attack action, so while it's only dealing 12 lightning damage, the rest of our action is going to be used to make it an additional attack, and it's potentially get more damage out of our action overall than those other options. Next, it's not using a spell slot, so we get to reserve those for our more versatile first level spells that we know. In fact, because we aren't using a spell at all, we could cast one of those spells as a bonus action on the same turn that we use Draconic Breath, which is very efficient action economy. And lastly, Draconic Breath targets Dexterity Saving Throws, which is better than the Constitution Saving Throw which Thunder Wave and Shatter require. This way, it's much more likely we'll deal the full amount of damage, whereas those spells may only deal half their normal damage, which feels pretty bad when we are using our Child Divinity option to hopefully get a lot of damage out. I would also note at this stage, if we chose the blue, sapphire or bronze dragonborn races from Fizzbound's Treasury of Dragons, we could potentially have an even stronger draconic breath option. The damage that those dragonborn races deal with their draconic breath is 2d10 at this level, and it will also scale to 3d10 when they reach level 11. However, the saving throw of those draconic breaths is based on our constitution modifier, so the save DC won't be quite as good. Still. Half of 20 damage or 30 damage when we reach level 11 is still really strong. For all these reasons, I feel like combining our Child Divinity from Tempest Cleric with a Draconic Breath from our race or class is going to be the better option. But wait, there's more. With our Draconic Strikes, we can choose to deal lightning damage. So what? We can deal maximum damage on our D6 Unarmed Strike, dealing 9 damage to a single creature when we include our Dexterity modifier. Not much, not a big deal. Well, what if I told you we can also stack Hunter's Mark on top of that? It's also dealing lightning damage because it's increasing our weapon damage. So now we're dealing 15 damage to that same creature with just one of our unarmed strikes. Okay, that's a bit better. But then what if we also went with Bugbear and we hit a creature before it's taken its turn, activating our surprise attack feature? Well, now we're dealing another 2d6 of lightning damage. So now when we maximize it with Destructive Wrath, and add Hunter's Mark, we could deal up to 27 damage on a single creature. That's actually pretty good. Or if we're not a bugbear, and instead we happen to get a critical hit with our Hunter's Marked Unarmed Strike, then we'd be able to deal that 27 damage as we'd be rolling a total of 4d6 on top of our Dexterity modifier. Nothing is worse than getting a critical hit only for those damage rolls to be really small, so being able to choose to maximize those rolls is very nice. Also, it's really great that we get to do this with an attack roll as opposed to a saving throw, as that gives us a lot more control over when we get to deliver that extra damage. If we use our Child Divinity on a saving throw effect, we would typically be expected to declare that we're using our Child Divinity before the enemies roll their saving throws. That might not happen at all tables, but I feel like it's reasonable to say that most tables would expect that order of applying effects. If we were to apply the Destructive Wrath feature after a creature's already failed its saving throw, that would feel a bit cheesy, a bit metagamey. Because of this, a creature we're targeting with that effect can potentially reduce that big damage by half just by making their saving throw. However, if we're applying the effect after an attack roll, that creature is definitely taking all of the damage. And we know the result of the roll before we roll that damage, so we can choose to use the feature when we get a critical hit. Much like a paladin when they're choosing to use their divine smite on a critical hit. Really, I think this is a great option if we're facing one or two creatures and don't see a good opportunity to use our blast effects with our child divinity. But is it a viable strategy to wait for a critical hit on our attack roll? 
Well, a monk can attack with their unarmed strike three or four times a turn, so actually our chances of landing a critical hit at some point are pretty good, especially if we've managed to get advantage from landing a stunning strike. So in those battles where we're fighting a single tough creature and we want to focus on damage, then placing Hunter's Mark on them and going to town with unarmed strikes is going to be a decent strategy. So overall, our Challenge Divinity is giving us ways to maximise our area of effect or single target damage, provided we are dealing lightning or thunder damage. And that is both really fun and really thematic for this Master of Lightning damage. I'd like to mention at this stage that we could use our Challenge Divinity in two other ways. We could turn undead. As we've been focusing on boosting our Wisdom score, it's going to be a really strong option as the saving throw is quite high. So whenever undead are present, don't waste our Child Divinity on Destructive Wrath, as we can probably get a lot more out of just turning them. The second option comes in the form of an optional feature from Tasha's Cauldron and everything, where we could potentially, once per day, turn our Child Divinity into a spell slot. This is a pretty great option too, so if we haven't found a good time to use Destructive Wrath, then we can at least use this feature to recoup a first level spell slot. Level 8, Cleric 3, Monk 5. At Cleric 3, we gain 2nd level spells. Also, we now have 4 first level spell slots, 2 2nd level spell slots, and our free usage of Hunter's Mark and Misty Step. From our domain, we gain Shatter and Gust of Wind. Shatter is potentially a really powerful option for our Child Divinity, as it could deal 3d8 thunder damage, or up to 24 damage when we decide to maximise it. This is really powerful, but we have other potential uses for our second level spell slot, which could be just as useful, if not more. Firstly, we tend to be operating from the back lines, so we should really be rewarding our frontline fighters. So, one of our second level spell slots each day should be spelt on the aid spell. This will increase three creatures' hit point maximums by five for the day. This could include ourselves and two characters who are usually mixing up in melee. We could also potentially use the silent spell as a second level spell, which is useful if we are fighting enemy spell casters. And because we aren't relying on spells for our blast effects, it can really swing those spell casting battles in our favour. Also, the spell Gust of Wind complements our forced movement options as we can use a combination of this with Telekinetic to push a creature 20 foot away from us. If they have to move against the wind on their turn, they'll be moving through difficult terrain, so they'd have at least 40 foot of movement to get back to their original position, which might be enough to take away their entire turn. Lastly, we could also choose to bless or bane four creatures with a second level spell slot. For these reasons, try to ignore the temptation to use our Child Divinity with Shatter, if the perfect opportunity arises, they'll let us hit four or more enemies at once and none of our allies, then okay, it might be a good call. But it shouldn't be the default choice, as with Draconic Breath, we can get 12 damage of an element of our choice while still going to use our weapon attack and our bonus action freely. Level 9, Cleric 4, Monk 5. With Cleric 4, we get another ability score increase. If we choose to increase our Wisdom here, then our Wisdom-based DC will be really strong. In fact, the DC will be 17. This makes our Breath Weapon and our Stunning Strike really reliable. And we can use Wrath of the Storm up to 5 times a day, which given we're trying to stay out of the front line should be more than enough uses. In fact, with our armor class now at 18, we actually could probably dip into the front line fairly often and provoke that Wrath of the Storm effect. One issue we might have is with our low dexterity, which is currently stuck at 16. This is making our attack rolls much less reliable. Because of this, it actually might not be a bad idea to, instead of boost our Wisdom modifier, boost our Dexterity modifier. Either option will increase our armor class to 80. Level 10. Cleric 5, Monk 5. From our domain, we gain Core Lightning and Sleep Storm. I've seen Core Lightning work really well, and with 3d10 damage, it could be a good option for our Child Divinity. But I've also been in plenty of environments where the spell can't work because the spell requires that we create a thunderstorm, effectively, to call lightning from. Sea Storm, meanwhile, is a great area of effect spell and works well with telekinetic for moving creatures into an affected area. Just a really good control effect that complements things like our stunning strike and our forced movement options. For other third level spells, we may want to use Spirit Guardians. It does great damage, and we can use our telekinetic feature to trigger the damage by pulling a creature into the area of effect. I think we should also definitely pick up Revivify, as we need to use this to protect allies when they do fall in combat. 
Also, aid, cast at third level, increase three creatures' hit points by ten. And finally, mass healing wood is a clutch spell for raising multiple allies at once, and again is a bonus action, which means that we can use it on the same turn that we use our extra attack for Draconic Breath. With so many great third level options, it makes me really happy that we don't have to use our spells for our channel divinity, and instead can use our monk features to trigger that. We really get the best out of being both a blaster and a cleric with this combination. And for those who know what the Tempest Cleric gets at 6th level, the best is yet to come. Level 11, Cleric 6, Monk 5. This is a massive level for our character, and I'm really glad we could get it before the end of our level 1-12 to 12 campaign. Firstly, we can use our Child Divinity twice per short rest, so now we can be extra blasty with maximising our damage dice. But the biggest benefit is from our Thunderous Strike feature. When we hit a large or smaller creature with lightning damage, we can push it 10 feet away from us. With our Draconic Strikes, we can move creatures up to 4 times a turn, with no concentration requirements or similar. This makes us fantastic at moving creatures around the battlefield chessboard style, and works well with our lightning-based attacks as we are using those to try and provoke a critical hit. It also means we can make better use of Draconic Breath. With our first attack, we could potentially move a creature into a better position, and then on the follow-up attack, potentially catch more enemies in our Draconic Breath's blast radius. Also at this level, we can use our Draconic Blast four times a day for free, and each time we choose to do this with lightning damage, we can move all the enemies it hits 10 foot away from us. Those enemies are going to take lightning damage whether or not they make their saving throw, so the effect of moving them away from us is entirely guaranteed. It's like being the Dragonborn from Skyrim. Between this and our telekinetic feat, we've become a master of forced movement, Repelling Blast Warlocks can just take a back seat. We can move more enemies on our turn and move them further. And if a creature manages to get within range of us, we can push them back again with Wrath of the Storm. This level is absolutely play-defining, and it's why I was so keen to push more Cleric levels instead of Monk levels, so we'd be able to play at least two levels of a level 1-12 to 12 campaign with this feature in play. And for our last level, level 12, Cleric 6, Monk 6. Because of how play defining Cleric 6 would be, we had to put off our 6th level of Monk for quite a while. However, level 12, we do get a nice capping campstone in Wings Unfilled. Now when we use Step of the Wind, we gain a fly speed equal to our walking speed until the end of our turn. And actually, it's a great time for us to gain this feature, as being able to manoeuvre around the battlefield more easily to knock creatures around in a direction of our choice is going to be really handy. However, what can this character do after level 12? Beyond level 12, we're two levels away from an ability score increase in both Monk and Cleric, so I'd be really tempted to take both of these classes to level 8 so we can really boost our Dexterity and Wisdom scores, taking them both to 20. Cleric 8 also gives us Divine Strike, letting us add an additional d8 of thunder damage to one of our weapon attacks each turn. This means our lightning punches can deliver even more damage. And if we manage to score a critical hit with this, then we can really amp up the damage by doubling that extra 2d8 of damage we're getting from that feature. After level 16, I think it makes sense to continue boosting our monk levels. This means we can grab the great level 11 feature from the way of the Ascendant Dragon before we reach level 20, giving us that bonus action fear effect, giving us resistance to certain elements, and a much, much stronger Draconic Breath, which we can also maximise and it gives us one last ability score increase to use as we see fit. Alternatively, we could have gone for a 6-14 split of Cleric and Monk if we really wanted to gain the Diamond Soul ability by level 20, so if we're building for something like a level 20 one-shot, that's probably a good option to go for. Final thoughts. Throughout this character's career, we've been able to lean into this Blasty Monk archetype, capable of dealing both great area of effect damage and good single target damage. We also had lots of good force movement options between Gust of Wind and Telekinetic at early levels, and eventually Thunderous Strike, letting us move creatures around the battlefield like ragdolls. In addition to this, we were able to focus our spells into aiding our allies, either boosting their hit points or healing them, while we continued to blast creatures with our monk features. This actually resulted in a very well-rounded and thematic character, truly a master over lightning. Thank you to everyone for watching this video. I hope you enjoy the new split of doing a subclass review and a build in two separate videos. 
Let me know your thoughts below on this class. I'd be really interested to see if you think this is a viable build. And otherwise, uh, look forward to see you in the next build video. Cheers.